Hello and welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. While the federal government's plans for education reform remained largely undetailed, the states have been reacting to the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday. New South Wales is happy with the model Gonski, David Gonski put forward, but other coalition states aren't so impressed. And in the federal coalition, there's a little bit of a gulf on the question of foreign investment, particularly the sale of Australia's largest cotton farm to a Chinese-dominated consortium. To discuss the day, I'm joined by Liberal MP Steve Chobo and Labor MP Michelle Rowland. Welcome to you both. We'll start first. Good afternoon. We'll start first with the Prime Minister's pitch to the Premiers on education reform. You will see the full figures when I have worked this through in discussions with states and territories. I've got some hard talking to do to states and territories because I am saying I am prepared uh, to lift federal government expenditure, but I've got to see states and territories step forward for their sh fair share. So there are discussions to be had, and of course, as we conclude those discussions, then you will see the appropriate budget treatment for the government's budget period, for the forward estimate, you'll be able to see all the details. There's no concrete funding, there's no specific timetable, there's no detail. Frankly, yesterday was not an announcement worthy of a Prime Minister. Uh, the idea uh, that someone like John Howard, for instance, would go to the National Press Club with something so vague and insubstantial, uh, it would have been totally out of character. Steve, the New South Wales Education Minister says there's nothing on the table, so there's nothing to be unhappy with. Should the states wait and see, uh, wait for the Prime Minister to present them with detail before making up their minds? Well, I think the Australian people are going to be waiting a long time for anything substantial to happen off the back of this. I mean, you know, I've got to say, Lyndall, to me, this was Julie Gillard channelling Bob Hawke with his No Australian Child Will Live in Poverty by 1990 speech. I mean, it's got as much likelihood of coming true. Uh, it's a ridiculous assertion by the Prime Minister because there's no backing, there's no financial support, there's not even a concrete timetable. Uh, all there but, is but is there the is, froth and bubble a, of an announcement. There is a timetable, isn't there, Steve, because the, the, the next round of education funding has to, be, has to be done from 2014 and the Prime Minister has laid out a broad timetable for the implementation of the education funding changes uh, ramping up from 2014 to the end of 2020. Well, I think, Linda, you knocked it on the head when you said a broad timetable. I mean, the reality is that from 2014, there's talk about it being fully implemented by 2020 with these world standards to be in place by 2025. But the question is, Lyndall, where's the money? Ultimately, this government, like everything else this government has done, is all about announcement with no follow-through on delivery. And bear in mind, Lyndall, we put this in a context, right, because this is about what Australian taxpayers can fund. This is a government that's got $145 billion of debt now, run the four biggest deficit budgets in Australia's history. They are silent when it comes to how they're going to miraculously find this three, four, five, six and a half billion dollars a year that they're now apparently going to be spending on kids' education. Michelle, the, the Prime Minister has flagged that there will have to be spending cuts to pay for this and she's flagged looking possibly at means testing things. Are you happy to have, have uh, fewer people getting government help if it, if it pays for education reform? I think what the Prime Minister was saying, Lyndall, is that we've made some tough decisions about savings and everything that we seek to do needs to come from savings elsewhere. I think that's what she was saying. I think the other point is, and I think you'll find every parent, principal and educator generally would agree with, is that in Australia, when it comes to education, postcode still matters and it shouldn't matter. We should have a system which is funded fairly based on need, and that is what Gonski is proposing. I'll also put in context this way too, Lyndall, is that it took us a long time for our 9,500 schools um, across Australia to be in the situation we are, where we are slipping in world rankings. It is going to take time to get up in those rankings again. And as someone from Western Sydney, whose uh, schools in my patch of the world stand to benefit greatly under this model, I actually appreciate that the New South Wales government has seen that this is an important uh, achievement, uh, one that is worth not only aspiring to but implementing as well. So I think we need to bear in mind that 
something that people actually get very annoyed with between elections is that a lot of decisions are made on the back of polls or simply looking to the next election. This is a long-term uh, strategy. But, it's a long-term given... strategy that will need to be worked out with the states and territories. But the, the government's had the Gonski report since the end of December. Should the Prime Minister at least have been talking in broad terms to the state premiers before now about what was possible? I think she has been talking in broad terms, uh, Lindor, and I think that the response from New South Wales, as one of the m more considered responses, uh, reflects that. Steve, you, you've, you've, you've criticised the Prime Minister for not detailing where the funding is coming from, but isn't, sure. it, isn't it normal government process to have, have funding identified in the budget primarily and also in the mid-year economic update, or would you advocate that future governments always detail where the money's coming from when a policy is announced? No, Lyndall, I mean, I just listened to Michelle, and in the same way that Michelle was doing the same thing the Prime Minister did, we heard all these wonderful platitudes, right? If, if all it took was platitudes and broad statements and great aspirations and lofty ideals, you know, Australia would be the greatest country on the face of the planet. Unfortunately, though, governments have to make tough decisions. They need to make real decisions involving money. Uh, and but what they we're make, seeing they is make that those in the budget, don't they? Yeah, but see, this is the problem with this government, Lindell. I mean, bear in mind, Wayne Swan and Julia Gillard have, have effectively hung their entire political careers upon this budget being a $1.5 billion surplus. Now, we already know from financial markets and from some of the massaging that's been taking place, that this year's budget won't be a surplus budget. In fact, is likely to be, you know, three, four, five billion dollars in deficit. That's the reason why this government's doing everything they desperately can to try to say, look, what we want to talk about here is aspiration. Let's not get caught up in the detail. Well, you know what? That's rubbish. Unless they're willing to talk detail, unless they're willing to explain where they're miraculously getting all of this money from, then the reality is that Australian families cannot trust this Prime Minister because this Prime Minister fails to deliver time and time again. Michelle, both sides of politics have been, uh, have been indulging in aspirational politics. Uh, the Prime Minister with her aspiration to lift school performance by 2025, the opposition leader with aspirations such as having more flexible childcare. Should politicians be careful not, not to be aspirational but to talk about what can actually be delivered? Lyndall, I think, I think what we need to get back to, and firstly, what a hide for Steve to start talking about um, black holes, but I'll put, that to, I'll put that budgetary black hole of his own to one side. <coughs> but, uh, but I think people want to know what plans uh, governments have in place, what plans, what narrative they have for their children, and far from talking in platitudes. Quite frankly, I've been to, what, 50-something schools are in my electorate, or at least one occasion. These are the things they're looking for. They are looking for a policy that will mean that their children from Blacktown are not disadvantaged when it comes to the same children who live in Borkley. <coughs> they are looking, debt, they are looking for a quality of opportunity. They are looking for a quality of opportunity. And when we talk about the Prime Minister's response to the Gonski Review, she has laid out a very clear plan of where she wants to take Australia. And by the way, this is not novel. You have governments around the world who years ago, for example, Singapore some 10 years ago, even more, said we are going to be the communications hub of the Asia-Pacific. They did everything towards that goal and they achieved it. We might, so we might move I certainly on now. don't think it's novel. We might move on now. Uh, Nationals members of the coalition have criticised the approval of the sale of Cubby Station, but Joe Hockey has criticised the Nationals. Some people are freelancing. They do not speak for the coalition. Uh, they don't even speak for the National Party or the Liberal Party. Steve, it's not just uh, uh, people like uh, uh, John Williams, National Senator, but the Senate leader, National Senate leader Barnaby Joyce and the Nationals leader Warren Trust that have been critical of the government's decision to approve this sale. Is, is sure. Joe Hockey right when he's saying they're freelancing or should, should the Liberal Party be listening more closely to the view of, views of the Nationals on this? Well, what we're listening for and what we're still waiting for is for a demonstration from Wayne Swan, the Treasurer, about why he's approved this sale. I mean, ultimately, the subject uh, here is the national interest and whether or not the sale of Cubby Station is in the national interest, and that's what Joe Hockey was addressing. Uh, what Warren Truss and Barnaby Joyce and others have been talking about is why Wayne Swan isn't willing to divulge to the Australian people how this is in Australia's national interest. And do you, really, do that's you believe the only it's question in the national here. interest to, to sell a property of the size of Cubby Station to, to overseas interests? 
Well, look, I can't comment directly on Cubby Station's decision because I don't have the privilege of having all the information that the Treasurer had, but I can talk in principles. And what I'll say about first principles when it comes to foreign investment is that I welcome foreign investment. I think that Australia is serviced very well by attracting capital, especially when you consider that we're in a credit crunch environment. The reality is the more capital we attract, the better our nation will do. Uh, so that's my principles statement about where I stand with respect to foreign investment. Uh, Michelle, do you think there should be some more transparency in the process? Look, I think there is clear transparency. I mean, it's, it's all done subject to an act of parliament, Lyndall. Like, it's not as though this is done uh, secretly and that people don't know what the tests are. You can even go on the FERB website and see what the tests are. I think as far as we're concerned, look, I'll, I'll give Steve a, a medal for his valiant attempt to bring together all the different interests that have been speaking out on his side lately. But I think we need to deal in the facts here. Cubby Station had been in voluntary administration for three years with some $300 million of debt. We have a Foreign Investment Review Board um, uh, recommendation. We have an announcement uh, by the Treasurer. Um, we even have conditions on the sale, a sell down by the consortium from 80% to 51% um, in a couple of years. So I think that the process is one that's transparent. If you want to know what factors go into that, you can read the legislation and the regulations or even go to the website. We might move on now. Uh, Nicola Roxon, the Attorney General, still hasn't made up her mind on the proposal to have people's communications data retained for up to two years, but she said it could allow uh, things like metadata, the time or, or uh, the time an email or phone call, an email is sent or a phone call is made, could that al allow that to be kept and that would, uh, that would help in law enforcement. Steve, people these days are storing lots of their information uh, uh, out of their own home in what's called cloud computing. Why would a policy sure. to retain data for two years and have law enforcement able to apply to get access to the data be a problem? Well, you see, at the moment, Lyndall, law enforcement can get access. They can get a warrant uh, for data. And indeed, last year, there were some 250,000 warrants or thereabouts. Uh, I've seen reports that were applied for. Uh, what we're talking about now, though, and what Nicola Roxon is opening the door for, is for Australian government, through ISPs, to mandate that every single Australian's internet usage, information uh, in terms of data usage, uh, where, which websites they've gone to, emails they've sent, we're talking about every single aspect of data being, by legislation, required to be retained for two years, and it is outrageous. We are talking about an expansion of government so that effectively every Australian is considered to be guilty until they can prove themselves innocent. I mean, I think that this proposal is akin, frankly, to tactics that we would have seen utilised by the Gestapo or groups like that. This is not the way Australia was meant to be. We are a free Western democracy, Michelle, and the notion that everyone's private data would be kept in this way is absurd. Michelle, we're running out of time, but do you believe that the the necessary constraints can be put in place to allow this proposal to go ahead? Lyndall, I've had very strong views on this for a number of years and anyone can go and Google and see the articles that I've written on this. What I would say is that when you put conditions that have been proposed in the manner that's been described in place, it's very difficult to remove them. We already have a very detailed interception and access regime. Law enforcement agencies have very broad powers, not only under the telecommunications legislation, but under other crimes legislation. I think it is incumbent for the Senate inquiry that's going on to show where there are gaps there um, before we go legislating to fill any. And that's where we'll have to leave it. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Be with us tomorrow.